Greetings, everyone. This is Chris Boylan, uh, CG supervisor for the AMC original animated series Pantheon. Um, today, uh, I wanted to take a look at a scene that I feel like really highlights exactly how this philosophy of integrating CG and 2D pipelines um, can really benefit uh, both both sides of this equation. Um, and so today we're going to be looking at a scene from the uh, first episode of season two. Um, and this is another one that I'm, I'm really proud of. Uh, um, just the way that I kind of orchestrated together, coordinating with the animator and, uh, um, you know, really producing something that I think, uh, again, just went above, you know, it, it, it's kind of a common theme with these videos here is that... Um, every new episode we were exceeding expectations we were learning new things we were all gaining experience and you know as the production continued uh, forward we we continued to improve and, and really sharpen our skills and so this is something that I feel like um, you know went off without a hitch really uh, from beginning to end and so we're gonna hop into it uh, right now so this here is a shot from uh, the end of the first episode of season two uh, you can see that, uh, you know, we have this really nice painted background. The character moves in, interacts with it, pulls it out, inputs a code, and then, um, obviously, you would expect the, the retinal scan to go and then the door to open up. Um, so this is a really interesting um, sort of hybrid with the production here. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you in a minute why. But basically, we were given, a you know, two paintings. We were given an A pose and a B pose. Um, and, you know... You, Animating geometrical objects in space is, is, is difficult. It's very hard. And especially something like this where, you know, I, personally for me, like, I wanted it to feel integrated. I wanted it to feel like the painting was moving. Um, I didn't want it to, to have this obvious effect of like, oh, there's the cell. There's the cell right there. It's, it's the one thing that in the background that's not painted. And then obviously the prospect of having to animate something like this by hand and then do like a painterly uh, treatment on top was just, you know, it was not cost effective. It was not something that the production had time for. And so this is one of those instances where CG, the CG department stepped in and we, we turned this around in, I think, a little over a week and a half. So um, without further ado, let's let's dive into the process and, and see how we did it. Okay, so here is the uh, here is the artwork that we received from uh, Background Paint. Beautiful painting, obviously. Um, our background artists were really on point um, in this one, and and uh, it, you know, to me, it was something that I really felt like I, I I really wanted to maintain this quality of the painting, how it felt impressionistic, um, but still very detailed. Um, and so you can see this is what we were provided with uh, this A pose here, and then this B pose. And so what I really want to highlight here, and I want to focus on, is you can see that the B pose is, um, it's not in the right spot, right? Um, when the when the handle opens, it's supposed to pull all the way up into the, uh, into the pocket here, right? It's not supposed to just pull and stop in the middle. So that, that actually uh, represented a bit of a hurdle for me uh, that I had to get over because, um, as you'll see, when I started to project the textures onto this um, object, it became difficult for me to line them up properly in the camera view. Um, so I'm going to pop into the uh, viewboard here so you can see. This is our, um, you can see now that, you know, this is essentially just, uh, you know, I did an F-Spy, match the camera. Um, there's no texturing on this. It's just, it's just a, a poly object, right? That's all it is. And that's, and that's really what we started with was I just... I made sure to plan the shot out so that the center axis was in the center of the panel, right? And I did that for a couple of reasons. One, because it would be a lot easier to model an object um, to be the proxy for this uh, handle thing, right? And two, because I knew that I was going to have to deliver the animation to the animator so that they could get working um, without being able to finish the texturing, without being able to finish the model. and so. I knew that I needed to rig this in space. And so I figured 
the best thing to do would be to make sure that this is as close to or on the center so that I can just build my rig how I want it and everything's going to be perfect. Um, so you can see here that <clears throat> for the most part it, it all lines up. You, you can see here that uh, the, the paneling extends upward and uh, you know we can obviously see through the painting. Uh, but I just did my best to kind of approximate exactly the shape that we needed. Um, and then I rigged it up. Very simple rig. Um, it's just basically like, uh, you know, a, t a couple targets, um, you know, like an IK, right? All I do is pull. And then this folds out automatically. Um, I think I did that with an animation constraint. Shoom, shoom. And so all I really did was I just delivered this to the animator, boom, just like that. And uh, they actually went in after the fact and retimed it, which was which was really nice to see because um, essentially this is just like a really simple, uh, you know, ease and pop. You know, it was just an ease out to a hard stop, boom, right, shoom. And uh, it was nice to see them, uh, the animator actually take that and kind of adjust the timing a little bit. So when they got these frames, they were able to take that into TV paint and just kind of move things around to how they wanted to the, the, the shot to go. And as you can see here as well, this isn't the full shot length. This is just, okay, I need 30 frames um, of this thing opening up. So um, once I delivered that to the uh, animator, I got started working on the texturing. And uh, so we're going to jump into a later shot so you can see uh, just how it all turned out. And we'll talk uh, in more detail about uh, the processes that went into building the asset. Okay, so here we have the uh, finished asset. You can see now that I've added a lot more in the way of the rig. Um, just in terms of controls, I wanted some offsets. I wanted the ability to depress these buttons. Um, I gave it an all mover. Every, all my rigs have, uh, you know, all movers, regardless of whether or not they're actually going to um, move around in the scene. And you can see, uh, let's just turn off auto key. So you can see that, again, it folds out automatically. Boom. But then we have an override here. If I want to do something like that, these should depress in. Yep. Boop, 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 boop. Right. And obviously, you know, they don't go that far and you can see it's, you know, they just set in there. So the really nice thing about um, modeling this, this asset uh, is even though that it was posed, I could, I could pose it up and sort of, uh, you know, just approximate where all the edge loops needed to be, right? And you can see here that... Uh, have my bevels and stuff, my my uh, subdivision modifiers, but I was just able to to you know using regular modeling just cut details out where they needed to go in camera, right? You can see that the finger points are all here, um, and just project this straight from the view onto the uh, onto the object, right? So if you go back here, um, you know we can see that this is this is all. Where's that hold up? Go. So you can see here that this is all, um, you know, really nicely lined up, right? So if I hide this, oh yeah, and then I was able to um, as well. I got the original Photoshop file, and I turned off the actual um, object itself inside the uh, the thing. And so essentially, what we did from here is um, I just projection mapped. The, the textures from the original asset, right? And then uh, I moved it into a different position and then I tried to text project uh, what I could onto this. And then after that, I just went ahead into Blender's native painting algorithm and just painted on top of this model in the scene. So it was a really nice um, way because, because of how the, the image was painted Right, the lighting conditions on the front and the lighting conditions on the top were a little different, and uh, you can see that a little bit here in the front and the and the back, right? So I wanted to make sure that it had this this same sort of uh, you know quality, and it blended, right? You can see the seam here is it's it's a little visible, but for the most part, um, you really can't tell that it's 
that it's you know been projected and painted on both sides and I, I cleaned up a lot of stuff especially with the cameras I mean they're, they're still a little wonky especially if you look at them from the front you can see they kind of burr. but uh, you know from from the actual camera perspective view they look pretty great um, so yeah then from there uh, you know what happened was what ended up what ended up going into this and this great this great process of going back and forth is that now I was able to pull in the finished animation and I, and I was able to actually time up you know these little star things that appear and if you notice there's a little bit of a wiggle in the device when um, what's his name uh, uh, presses the buttons I can't remember the guy's name off the top of my head Pope his name is Pope so um, let's see if it, if it plays and, and you can see here oh. Boop, 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 boop. So there's actually a little bit of a wobble. It might it might be a little less apparent in the EV version, but in the in the final render, um, it came together really nicely. Uh, you know, a couple of other things here. These these numbers were um, essentially like a texture sheet that I got from, I think from um, art department, and uh, I just I just grabbed those those textures, projecting them right onto the to the uh, keys here, and then maybe just some straightforward cell shading stuff, maybe just a little bit of paint paint work on them, but uh, for the most part, they're they're pretty much just right out of the box with some with some texture mapping. Um, the the light itself, uh, I when I projected the texture on, I removed the glow on purpose. Let's see if we have bloom on here. Yeah, so the bloom's not active in this in this scene, but um, I output a different bloom pass, so you can see that there's an emission on this light, and it it uh, it lights up and then you know when when it pops over boop, 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 you can see everything's glowing really nice um, so I, I kicked that out uh, in a different compass for the compositors and and really the shot came together really nicely I mean this is one of those like the background painting looks so nice I really wanted to put the effort in to actually make something that matched as close as possible and to use the original artwork as much as possible. Um, and so you can see as well some things here uh, and in the final I'll pull up in just a minute uh, so that we can review it again. You'll see there's um, there's actually like real projected shadows. So in the case of the original image, I actually painted out the shadows um, in here, um, a little bit in here, but not so much because it was just kind of a pain in the ass. But um, you know, I actually lit this, you can see if, uh, if we do this and rotate it. Yeah. So you can see that this is a 3d object with, with cast shadows. And it was really nice to help with integration because, and then I was able to do a shadow catcher pass and, uh, project shadows onto the wall that we could then send to comp, uh, which just integrated it even more. Right. It's cause instead of it being a, uh, you know, a 2d object that gets pulled out of the wall and there's no shadow casting on the wall. And the shadows don't actually move because they're baked in. This was actually dynamic, right? The way that it moved. Um, and so let's let's have a look at the final shot again, and we'll uh, we'll we'll go over those details. All right. So here's the the final shot. You can see that the uh, the main device there is jostling a little bit as the buttons are depressed. Um, the buttons actually do depress as well, um, although it happens so fast that you might not notice it. And you can see that the, the shadows are projecting onto the wall. Um, obviously, the, the, little, the little vibration is a little bit more apparent in the shadow if you look on the right there. Um, but, you know, overall, a really nice uh, effect here. You can see the shadow is receded into the actual wall and casts properly. And uh, I think this, this shot really came together um, really nicely. And uh, it's, it's just, again, another, another example of how when we're working in tandem with 2D and we're planning things out and communicating, that's the most important thing. And this is something that I've, I've always believed in um, for my entire career, from when I was a technical artist all the way to now. It only helps to go talk to somebody, to go talk to whoever the, whoever it is that you're, you're working with, wh whoever the, whatever the team is, the, uh, you know, the artist that you're delivering to, the artist that you're receiving files from, make sure you're talking to them. Make sure you're always talking to them because the more you guys have established a dialogue and the more of a, rep of a rapport 
that you can uh, generate within the team, the easier it's going to be to ask somebody for something or to tell them, like, what do you need? Or ask them, what do you need? How can I get it to you? Be someone who is useful. Be someone who is always facilitating and eager to facilitate in any in any mode. Um, you know, I think a lot of times people tend to just sort of get into their own work mode and just sort of zone in and not necessarily think about like bigger picture stuff. And and that's not to say that that's anything like a knock against any specific artist. It's just that it's all how we are. We get, we get hyper-focused in on what we're doing and then we don't stop to like take a breath. And I think that sometimes it's good to take a step back and say, you know, how, how are you expecting this to come to you? What, what, what do I need to give to you uh, in order for you to give back to me? And this, this was another one of those uh, situations where that just worked out perfectly. We were able to take this retake um, from start to finish very quickly. I, like I said, I, I turned this around in a week and a half um, and that the 2D animation was done by the end of the second week. Um, and really, I think just, you know, being, being how this, this was a very hybridized and, and um, collaborative environment, we were, just, we were able to, to utilize that and we were able to make things very quickly and, and at a very high quality. And I think it shows here. Um, you know, this is great. This is something that's a very understated shot. It's not something you're going to think about. It's like, what, four seconds or something like that? And that's it. Um, but it's something that, you know, we took the time to really think about. And you don't notice it. And that's the biggest thing. You don't notice it. It's there. It's nice. We move on to the next shot. Um, and that's really the most important thing, especially with CG especially with CG integration into 2D animation. We, we don't want you to notice that the CG is there. You see it, you go, ooh, that's pretty, but you don't notice, or we don't want you to notice that it's CG. We don't want you to sit there watching your favorite show go, that's a CG background. Because then you've lost, you've lost your immersion, right? You've lost, you know, what, what's the story about now? You're, you're, you're too busy staring at the, you know, the dragon that looks stupid flying through the background or some whatever, you know? So again, this is just another example of that, how we were able to collaborate together and how we were able to put together a really nice uh, finished product here. Um, so again, with that, uh, let's wrap up here. I, I'd say um, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. Uh, as always, uh, give us a like, subscribe. Um, and uh, yeah, if you, if you uh, wanna collaborate in the future, please feel free to reach out. Until then, Sayonara.